This is a continuation of Wayfaring Stranger, Al's Song, Part 1. My brother Al's life here on earth was a struggle, and he was far from perfect. But God doesn't view man the way that man views man, and I am confident I will see my brother in heaven. We all come into this world the same way. Human beings with a sinful nature and incapable of attaining perfection. This is true for everyone, regardless of race, nationality, or status in this life. For God to be God, He must be perfect. A perfect God has perfect standards, and man is guilty of falling short of those standards of perfection, no matter how esteemed he is in the eyes of man. A guilty person cannot become innocent no matter what he does. As an illustration of this principle, in any legal system, a guilty person remains guilty even if he performs the sentence of his guilty verdict. The conclusion is that man can try all he wants through his own efforts to meet God's standard of perfection, but he cannot do it on his own because no matter what he does, he is still guilty. How can imperfect man be reconciled to a perfect God? Thankfully, God has provided the solution. However, man is free to either accept or reject God's solution, and God will honor that decision. God's solution was to provide a perfect mediator, Jesus the prophesied Messiah, the Lamb of God, also called the Christ from the Greek Christos and the Mashiach in Hebrew, who received the substitutionary judgment for every violation of God's standards of perfection by every member of the human race, past, present, and future. An expanded translation of the original Koine Greek in John 3.16 reads, For God demonstrated His undiminished love to the human race that He gave His uniquely born Son for the purpose and with the result that anyone who believes in Him will not perish but will have eternal life. It is an historical fact that Jesus exists and was nailed to a cross at Calvary almost 2,000 years ago. For three hours on that cross, he was separated from God the Father as he willingly accepted the imputation and judgment for the sins of the entire human race, past, present, and future. In other words, he received our debt as a substitute for us. This was a judicial imputation, as Jesus is perfect and did not deserve it. When he said on the cross, Father, why have you forsaken me? He was not confused. He was at that time receiving the judgment for all mankind and was completely separated from the Father. His was a rhetorical question for our benefit so that we would understand he was being judged and was separated from the Father. When the judgment was complete, Jesus said the Koine Greek word to telestai. The translation of this word is literally paid in full. In those times, to telestai would be written on a note of debt to indicate that the debt had been paid in full. And he had paid in full the debt of the entire human race. Following this, he stated, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He willingly dismissed his soul and human spirit, resulting in physical death. It was not his physical death that paid our debt, but rather the judgment that he received in our place. We know that God's standard was satisfied with this substitutionary judgment as Jesus was resurrected three days later. We all have a soul. 
It's that invisible, immaterial part of you that never, ever dies. It consists of your self-consciousness, your volition or free will, your mentality, and your conscience. God in His omniscience knows what your soul thinks. If you believe by faith in the privacy of your soul that Jesus was the perfect mediator between God and man, that He was judged on the cross at Calvary for your debt, then God is now free to credit to you a judicial imputation of His perfect righteousness and you now have a permanent irrevocable relationship with Him and an eternal future in heaven. God's perfect righteousness is a judicial imputation to man because we are all imperfect and neither earn nor deserve it. This is amazing grace. Genesis 15:6 speaks of the imputed righteousness that Abraham received by faith. And the Apostle Paul explains it as well in Romans 4, 3 through 8, and Romans 5, 18 through 20. My brother Al believed this. It's the reason he's in heaven today, and that I have the confident expectation that I will see him again. The Apostle Paul used the Koine Greek word elpis to describe his anticipation of his eternal future. Elpis has a far stronger meaning than the word hope that it is translated as in the English. The literal translation of Elpis from the Koine Greek into the English is confident expectation. In Romans 5 1 and 5 2, Paul writes, Having been justified by faith, let us have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also, by means of faith, we have attained access into this grace in which we stand. And so let us demonstrate, Elpis, confident expectation regarding the integrity of God. If you think that faith alone in Christ alone as the basis for your qualification to spend eternity in heaven sounds too easy, consider that it wasn't easy for Jesus to live 33 years on this earth under tremendous testing and endure the judgment for the sins of the entire human race and the physical agony of his trials and crucifixion while maintaining sinless perfection the entire time. God's salvation plan is simple for a reason. He wants everyone to have the opportunity to use their own free will to believe the saving work that Jesus already accomplished so that His integrity is free to credit to them His perfect righteousness. With God, there is victory in both my brother's life and his death. One good decision, the most important decision of his life, guaranteed his eternal future, no matter what transpired here on earth. A free will decision of faith alone in Christ alone for salvation and eternal life can also give you the confident expectation of an eternal future in heaven. God will honor your free will decision to accept or reject His grace plan. Thank you for your interest. Wayfaring Stranger, Al Song Part 3 is a musical tribute to God's grace in remembrance of my brother Al.